Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn, the Artificial Intelligence Revolution. My name is Michelle Kastner and I am pleased to serve as the UW Foundation Board Representative Director for the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. It is my great honor today to introduce to you Ed Lazowska. Ed is in his 47th year as a University of Washington faculty member. During that time, he has helped UW's computer science program grow into one of the finest in the nation and the world. UW CSE is currently ranked fifth after MIT, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and UC Berkeley. It is one of the largest programs at the University of Washington, currently awarding more than 600 bachelor's degrees annually. With Tom Alberg and Jeremy Jake, Ed led the fundraising efforts for the Paul G. Allen Center for Computer Science and Education that was dedicated in 2003. With Brad Smith, he led the fundraising efforts for the Bill and Melinda Gates Center for Computer Science and Engineering dedicated in 2019. He is one of nine active faculty who are members of the Na National Academy of Engineering. I have known Ed a long time and I am still inspired by his never-ending energy and passion for the University of Washington and UW Computer Science. I am so grateful for the amazing community he has built around the Allen School. His enthusiasm is infectious, he is truly beloved, and I am fortunate to call him a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Ed Lazowska. Thanks, Michelle, for that lovely introduction, and delighted to have you as a friend. Um, so this is going to be uh, uh, a sort of mixed presentation. I'm going to give you an overview. We're going to have a panel presentation. Then there are a set of tables that you'll visit for uh, deeper dives. Let me just begin with an overview of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's not new. The phrase artificial intelligence was coined in 1955. Okay? 70 years ago, and it was in a document entitled A Proposal for the Dartmouth Summer Research Project in Artificial Intelligence. And let me read you what the uh, four authors of that proposal said. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. We think that a significant advance could be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists worked together for a summer. <laughs> okay, so this was a little bit optimistic, but you know, we've had seven decades of fits and starts and forward progress. Um, there have been hype cycles, periods of sort of unrealistic optimism, uh, followed by periods of cynicism. Uh, and we'll talk about that a bit more, but let's talk about what AI is. It's a collection of subfields. It's uh, machine learning, robotics, natural language processing, computer vision, speech recognition, uh, natural language processing, machine translation, reasoning and planning. Um, there's been extraordinary progress in the past decade, and it creates a set of opportunities, huge opportunities, and a set of challenges, and that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, the burst of progress has been driven by a, uh, uh, a, a confluence of several factors. Uh, one is the availability of unprecedented streams of data, because AI is driven by the data that these programs can collect and observe. Second, uh, dramatic drops in the cost of storing and retrieving that data. Third, uh, dramatic increases in available computing power, just unimaginable. And uh, fourth, algorithmic advances in a field called machine learning. So machine learning is computer programs that recognize patterns in data uh, and that get better as they process increasing amounts of data, improve themselves, is what the uh, folks said in 1955. Uh, so he here's an analogy. And, and uh, you know I, I won't talk about how you get computers to do this, but when my now 47-year-old son was about five years old back in the middle 1980s, uh, and he was bringing me to the airport to fly out of town on university trips a lot. I taught him to recognize airplanes, 727, 737, 747, 767, by just pointing to airplanes on the ground and in the air and labeling them. 
And pretty soon, he could do this stupid pet trick. You'd point to a plane, and he would give you the name of the plane. Okay? The more planes he saw, the more accurate he became. All right? And that's how machine learning sort of began. We would feed the programs lots of labeled data, okay? And they would learn to recognize items that corresponded to those labels. There's now approaches in essentially self-training without the use of labels, which is, of course, far more scalable. But that's the basic idea, okay? Which is to teach computer programs to, sorry, create computer programs that can do what my five-year-old kid could do back in the 1980s, recognize cats or dogs or airplanes. Um, so breakthroughs in machine learning uh, have provided a huge step function in what we can do. And many of the things that we have been making slow progress on for decades are suddenly more or less ready for prime time. Uh, so before turning to the panel, let me say a bit about the University of Washington and artificial intelligence. Um, we've got to be a leader in advancing artificial intelligence, that is advancing the technology, in using it to advance all fields, and I'll say more about that in a second, and in preparing all students to survive and thrive and lead in a world in which AI is absolutely pervasive. So lead in AI, lead in the use of AI, and lead in preparing students to thrive in this new world and to lead. And we'll do this. The leadership is deeply committed to it. The provost, uh, Mario Ostendorf, the vice provost for research, Magda Balazinska, the director of the Allen School, Anin Day, the dean of the I School, Andy Connolly, the director of the eScience Institute. Leaders across the university are committed to it. The provost is in the process of creating a task force in AI. Anin will co-chair the task force to consider all aspects of artificial intelligence at the University of Washington from education to business practices. Um, so let me tell you how we get there using data science as an example. Um, nearly two decades ago, we at UW saw the emergence of data science uh, as a field that was going to be really pervasive, transformational. It built upon computer science and statistics. Uh, its applications were going to be really pervasive. Uh, my friend Jim Gray, uh, late of Microsoft, uh, referred to data science as the fourth paradigm of scientific discovery. There was experiment and observation, there was theory, there was computational science, and there was data science. Artificial intelligence is the fifth, par the fifth paradigm of discovery. All right? So, for example, David Baker's protein folding and protein structure calculation work, which you've surely heard about here many times, is now entirely driven by artificial intelligence. Um, and we realized that UW uh, needed to, sorry, that was, uh, I leapt to AI, excuse me. Um, so every sector of the economy was going to be powered by data science as well. And we realized that UW had to be a leader in advancing the field of data science, in using data science to advance other fields, and in educating students to thrive in this data-rich world. We established the UW eScience Institute. It was supported by the Moore Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, the Washington Research Foundation, the state, the university, the National Science Foundation. Um, and the faculty led the creation of courses and programs across the university that made every student able to learn the data science they needed in their field. And as an example, you can get a uh, bachelor's degree in geography with the data science option. You can get a PhD in biology with the advanced data science option. You can get a master's degree in data science at the University of Washington. Okay? Um, we created a huge menu of informal educational options, uh, short courses, seminars, consulting, office hours. Uh, at the introductory level, the Allen School and the Information School now teach introductory courses in computer science and data science that had 10,000 student enrollments in the last year. Okay, so it really has pervaded the campus, and we will follow the same path in AI. UW has been a leader in the technology of AI and artificial intelligence itself for decades. The original uh, joint conference on artificial intelligence back in the 1960s was chaired by Alastair Holden, who was an electrical engineering faculty member. So we go back a long way. Um, the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, led by UW faculty members, uh, is an incredible asset, as are many of the companies around here, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. Um, 
And as I said, AI is really succeeding data science as this next paradigm of discovery. Uh, the eScience Institute under Andy Connolly's leadership, and you'll meet Andy soon, uh, has been uh, leading efforts in uh, imagining AI education across the campus as it did in data science. Steve Brunton, who you'll meet later today, uh, has been leading efforts to design AI educational modules focused on its use in engineering. So by the way, we can certainly use your help in generating support for these initiatives, but uh, it's just an incredibly exciting time. So having taken too long with the introduction, let me uh, introduce the uh, five panelists and ask them to join me on the stage here. Uh, Eileen Kaliskan, please come up from the Information School, Andy Connolly from Astronomy, Shwedek Patel from the Allen School, Noah Smith from the Allen School, and Jevin West from the Information School. I can't count it. There are five chairs or six over there. OK, I guess I will stand over here and uh, I, I <laughs> attempt to speak to you folks from, uh, oh, is there a chair? There's a chair. Terrific. So what we'll try to, try to do here is just give you a, uh, an overview. And then what we're going to do later on is there are seven tables arrayed around the room on different topics. And you'll have the chance to visit at least three of them during the remainder of our time. And part of your job is going to be to figure out which ones you want to visit. So um, let me begin by talking about large language models. And uh, let me ask you, Noah, what they are. This is what all the buzz is about, GPT-4, chat GPT, these things called large language models. So what do they do? What are they capable of? What aren't they capable of? OK, so um, can you hear me all right? Hi. OK, Noah Smith, um, professor in the Allen School. Uh, I, I work in the field of natural language processing. Uh, language models are a technology that's been around since the 1960s, almost since the time Ed was talking about when the field of AI was kind of born. Um, and they've, been, they've actually been in use in a, lot of, in a lot of kinds of systems for a long time. Um, and they're, they're very simple to explain. This is why I love giving broad audience talks about language models, because it's, it's easy. It's extremely easy. And I can demonstrate with an example. I'll start a sentence. And I'm going to have, when I stop, I'm going to have Ed guess the next word. Uh -oh. You ready? All right. Um, this week, the Biden ad administration announced a new initiative. OK. And you were probably all thinking that word, too. That was the word I had in my head. Um, the point is, guessing the next word, um, that's what a language model is. It's essentially a very complicated model that learns from a whole lot of data, like Ed talked about, to predict what word will come next in a sequence. And it doesn't have to be words. It can be other things. It could be the next symbol in a piece of code. It could be the next note in a piece of music. But the idea is you're predicting the thing that will come next after having looked at a huge amount of examples. And what's happened in the past few years is language models have gotten really big. When you hear the phrase large language model, that usually means it was trained on a large amount of data, and it has a lot of moving parts. It's, a, it's large in the sense that there are many tunable parameters that had to be estimated. Now I'm getting technical. But the main point is they've gotten really good at predicting the next word. And the surprise from, let's say, five years ago is that if you're really good at predicting the next word, that also gives a sense that you have, like, being really good at predicting the next word usually requires having some awareness of the world, some understanding of how language works, but also the world we live in. Because when you read an, a whole lot of text that people have written, you start learning about the social world. You learn things that people believe are true. You learn what's in the data. And these models, in some sense, are remembering that. So they become, they become extremely good at prediction, and then they turn out to be useful for a whole bunch of other things. And I think we tend to equate fluency with intelligence. So we think of these models as being intelligent, are they? Well, I mean, when it, this makes sense, right? When you interview somebody for a job, if they speak really well, they make a positive impression. But we've all met people who are extremely fluent, and then they turn out not to live up to that expectation. And I think the same thing tends to happen with language models. We're not used to seeing fluency in, in, in something that we engage with, like ChatGPT without all the other aspects of intelligence. We tend to assume 
that when, when something or someone is fluent, all the other stuff is there. But I think it's a trick. Um, they are very fluent. They are very useful. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that this is a bad development. I think it's an extremely exciting time. But we have to be very careful not to mistake the base thing, which is fluency, for all the other stuff that makes up intelligence, which is a very complicated thing, right? Being intelligent is actually highly multidimensional. All right, so the important thing to remember is these models that all the buzz is about are basically predicting the next word. That's what's going on. So there's an enormous investment on the part of companies. Uh, what's the role of universities? Andy? So um, thanks, Ed. So I'm Andy Conley. I'm the director of the Science Institute. Um, I think there's many roles for the university and universities, and I think there's many responsibilities for the universities as well. Um, as you've said and as Noah has talked about, um, many of the kind of the fundamental discoveries and the, uh, what drive these large language models or these, um, these new deep learning techniques came from universities. Uh, in, you can think of the, what we're doing as uh, equivalent to the basic sciences, right? We've developed the basic sciences techniques, understanding how proteins work, understanding how materials work, and then that evolves into industry in terms of developing new methods, new drug discoveries, um, new medical procedures. And I think this, this symbiotic relationship is really important for us as, universe, as a university and how we actually interact with uh, what the industry is doing. And it means that we have to lead on the methodological side as well as being able to take um, researchers and faculty who work at the interface who can take these methods and apply them into um, physics and biology and chemistry. So one thing that industry has is vast computing resources compared to any university. There is a new uh, national AI research resource pilot and initiative which is designed to uh, uh, empower the research community with computing capabilities analogous to those in industry, but it's a really steep climb, okay? So Facebook, for example, Jan LeCun, one of the inventors, if you will, of these large language models, gave a wonderful talk two days ago. We're off. Thank you. Two days ago, um, in the uh, electrical and computer engineering uh, LIDL lecture series, and uh, um, he's uh, pointed out that the computer he uses in Facebook AI research, just the research organization, is a billion dollar computer, okay? It has uh, 60,000 GPUs, these advanced processing units, but it's, it's a billion dollar machine. And uh, let me just say UW does not have a billion dollar computer at its disposal, nor does the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy or anybody else. Okay, Microsoft is spending billions of dollars, many billions of dollars with zeros after them every quarter deploying new data centers. But what I would say is what we do have is we have this incredible ability where people and ideas co-mingle. Mm -hmm. And that means that um, if you have, if you're developing a method, that method can then filter into the sciences, into the engineering. That can lead to new discoveries. Those discoveries drive the need for new methods, and that brings it back into the development of these techniques, whether it's in statistics or computer science or electrical engineering. And it's this, in data science, we often refer to it as this virtual cycle. And I think mixing metaphors a little bit, one of the roles of the university is to oil the wheels, right, to make sure that that virtual cycle is as efficient as possible. And I think one thing that's really important about the university is that it that is different from industry is that we tend to be open, right? And if we're open, then we can share ideas. We can share techniques. We can share whether those techniques and where, where they work and where they don't work. And I think that's really important for us in terms of you know, accelerating the discoveries that we're going to make, not just in the computer science, but also in biology and medicine and chemistry and physics. Got it. So let's talk about the role of Seattle. You know, in yeah. information technology, we've benefited enormously from the Seattle tech ecosystem. Yeah. I think it has benefited UW, and UW has benefited it. When I moved here and God help us, 1977, Microsoft was 12 people in Albuquerque, okay? So 
uh, you know, times have changed and we're becoming a center of AI as well. Shwetek? I mean, yeah, I mean, this is the best place to be for AI. I mean, if you look at all the companies, Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, Google, uh, all the startups, uh, all the investment, Madrona, Pioneer Square Labs, like this is the best place to do AI. And that's an advantage for the University of Washington. You know, we do all this incredible research at UW, but the fact that the industry, the startups, uh, AI2, those institutes that are local, is a huge advantage for us. In fact, a lot of our colleagues, and even myself, um, go back and forth between industry and the university because, you know, as Andy was saying, we can, you know, as a university, we can innovate on new concepts and applications and foundational research, but one way to do that is to actually directly influence industry. So a lot of us who actually straddle academia and industry are able to directly influence where industry is going. Because it's one thing to say that, hey, we'll write a paper, we'll throw it over the fence, industry will adopt it. It never happens. When does that really happen? So because the pace of innovation is so fast in AI, we have to be embedded. And the University of Washington is incredibly unique. Incredibly unique. Just one thing to underscore is I have colleagues that from other institutions that come up to me like, how do you do this? How can you be there and there and it just works out? That's the UW for you, right? You can't do this at other places. And so that's unique because of our geography, the, the, the industry that's near us, and just how we operate as a university, this public-private relationship and the blurring of the lines is I think how we're gonna actually make a difference using uh, in AI. And I'm, we're grateful that we can do that, but I think that's the incredible asset that we have is the tech industry, the AI to institute, um, and also all the investment from a VC perspective and the labs that are uh, developed around that is, is something that uh, we're, we're very grateful for and very unique in this area. So talk a little more about entrepreneurship. Yeah, I mean, entrepreneurship is, I mean, this is, so one of the things that's really interesting about AI is that, you know, um, uh, you know, it used to be something that only a small number of people could do, big companies could do. You know, if you think about like what AWS and Azure and GCP, like cloud computing did for making it easier to do things that are, you know, database centric, where you don't have to build your own data center, you don't have to have this large rack in your startup, and you don't have to worry about that capital. You can innovate on the application. That's exactly what's happened with AI now with large language models. You know, Ed was talking about, you know, labeling all these data sets. That's expensive. That's a lot of capital to label things. And if you look at these large language models that Noah was talking about, it already embeds enough knowledge to actually start to do things that a startup could not do in the past. It has enough basic knowledge to build these applications that you could do it with a three-person team and you could use these models that are already available. So it's really changed the game in terms of who can participate in AI. So let's uh, transition to some of the concerns. First, uh, misinformation and disinformation. <clears throat> Devin, this is your life. <laughs> yeah, if you came here for some good news, I won't be able to give you as much <laughs> of that. Um, there's, there's always good sides and bad sides to technology, and I want to make sure I address both when I address this issue of misinformation. So I'm a faculty member in the information school, and I co-founded what's called the Center for an Informed Public. We live and breathe literally every day, 24 hours a day in many cases. Um, this issue of misinformation, how rumors spread across different social media platforms, how they spread offline, online, what we can do as a society to really get a hold of this challenge. Because it affects everything. It affects our the, the trust that the public has in universities. It has everything to do with how you know, we get enough funding and, and, and trust from investors to, to do startups. It has everything to do with our politics, solving climate change, everything. Um, and so when it comes to AI, it's one of those things where we're seeing it in real time today. So if you read the news today, you may have heard of this, these non-consensual images of Taylor Swift going around on X. Now this was generated, this was AI generated, and X finally took it down even though they're having some real um, uh, challenges with their, their uh, trust and safety team, let's put it that way. Um, and this, this image had already been viewed uh, about 47 million times before it spread. Now, that's Taylor Swift, and it's gonna get a lot of attention, but what about all of our daughters um, and all of the other uh, individuals that this has already affected in middle school and in high school? And that's just one of many, many different kinds of examples that we're challenged with. But a lot of people think, well, Jevin, you're just looking out at the problem and, and, and with your colleagues, of course, and all the students that we work with, that's important, but we need to be thinking solutions. Well, that's where we spend about as, just as much time, and we can't address this issue without leaning in to AI. And I'll give you an example why. So Facebook has about 80,000 people that it's employed to do um, sort of content moderation, to pull down really problematic content. 80,000, sounds like a lot, right? 
it doesn't even come close to doing what you need to to really scale this. The only re way, really, is that we have to then use that, uh, that same technology that's being used to generate a lot, of these pro uh, a lot of this content in all these different modes in video and text. So what we're doing in our center right now at the university, and I'm proud to say I think we're the, le the international leaders on this sort of thing, is that we're studying this sort of thing, but then also really leaning into interventions, and that's where we can really think about artificial intelligence, these large language models and all the things that are coming out of this, um, this space. And so I think, uh, in fact, I just had a conversation today with some investors, and I want private investment in this because I think, I hope people make tons of money on the, the fixing part of the, this, this problem, and I think UW could really be a center for that sort of thing for as big of a problem as we're dealing with. I think the key thing is that AI is one of the contributors to the problem, of which there are many contributors, and it is the solution to the problem in the long term. That's exactly right. Okay, so let's uh, turn to ethical considerations. Eileen, that's uh, your expertise. Hi, everyone. I'm Eileen Kaliskan, and I'm an assistant professor at the Information School, also the co-director of the Tech Policy Lab, and my research focuses on artificial intelligence, bias, and ethics. We have been hearing how artificial intelligence systems are advancing, and their performance has improved so much that they are learning all the imperfections of society from sociocultural data. And this raises many ethical concerns because, for example, when I use ChatGPT to translate gender neutral sentences, Obir Doctor, Obir Hemshire, to English, the output is he's a doctor, she's a nurse. And this biased output does not have trivial solutions to mitigate or reduce these biases. We have shown that this is a problem in 2016 because large-scale sociocultural data embeds the implicit associations and biases of humans that have been documented in social psychology regarding gender, social class, race, ethnicity, ability, age, intersectionality. And accordingly, now these advanced models are learning these nuanced details of bias and perpetuating them in their outputs and decisions as they are making consequential decisions about humans that determine our lives, outcomes, and opportunities. And they are shaping society rapidly in ways that we don't exactly understand because in some cases, we don't know how they are deployed or how they are being used in human AI collaboration settings. They offer tremendous opportunities to automate tasks efficiently and to make mundane things much easier for humans. But they also impact human cognition and agency. However, we have many unanswered questions in this domain. And since this is at its core a socio-technical problem, we need three-pronged approaches that require technical solutions to reduce these biases that affect equity and justice, as well as tech policy solutions, regulations, and standards while raising public awareness that these models are biased and they don't just perpetuate bias. We have seen that they are right now amplifying bias regarding the historically disadvantaged groups that we have been uh, seeing in society. And accordingly, we have many open questions. This is a dynamic problem. Unless society becomes perfect, AI systems will be imperfect and we will need to work on these issues. Great, so before turning to the uh, tables, one last question, and that is the role of AI in education, both education in AI and uh, AI in education. It kind of cuts both ways, Andy. So I think we've, we've heard from all the panelists that it, it, it's clear that AI is gonna change how we live, how we work, how we interact, how we do research, and how we teach. There are clearly issues associated with um, you know, the, the biases associated with and how we use AI in society. But I think we have to remember that the, we train the students who then go into the workforce that build these tools, that develop these methodologies, whether they stay in industry, or whether they stay in academia or if they go into industry. And I think the, one, the great thing about this university is we have the opportunity to teach students who are broad. Right? So we can teach them about policy, we can teach them about law, we can teach them about ethics while we teach them computer science and statistics and machine learning and physics and biology. 
And I think we can learn a lot from what we did with the data science initiatives about how we build out educational programs within our university. So we made sure that we were strong in terms of faculty in the method side. We made sure we hired um, faculty who could work at the interface, who could build the educational material that is important for um, it's, it's important that we develop courses that are appropriate for um, someone who works in the arts or the humanities and not say that you have to go and take 15 uh, computer science classes before you can actually really understand how AI will not just amplify your areas of interest, it, but it will um, amplify your creativity, it will accelerate your ability to make discoveries. Uh, we looked at, and we're doing this now, we looked at um, how we develop curricula that work across the campus. And we're doing this with Hannah and Eileen are, are part of a working group to look at what does it mean to teach AI on campus. And that, as Ed said, it's a whole broad thing. You have to understand the data. You have to understand the techniques. You have to be able to apply those text techniques. And you have to understand when they work and when they don't work. And we also provide the, provided the infrastructure of experts who could help the faculty accelerate into that space. But I think this, the, one of the other questions is that what's different about AI from what we did with data science. And with data science, I think we're about five years ahead of the game. With AI, it feels like we're on the cusp, and there's a concern that the rapid development of AI means that we can fall back. The scale's different as well. Long before ChatGPT and OpenAI and all the excitement about the language models, we had, as part of an AI at UW initiative, we had a meeting in this room. 300 researchers came here to talk about how they were using AI in their research. So it's already all over campus. So you can't roll it out to, to the sciences and engineering and then allow it to kind of spread across campus. It's already across campus. And I think the other thing is we've got to think about that there's 15,000 researchers on this campus. They also need to be upskilled. And if we can upskill them, think about the potential that you have for discoveries from the whole of this campus. So I think there's, there's a lot of places where we know we're really good at doing cross-disciplinary education. There's a lot of work still to do in this space, but I think we, 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 we have a huge opportunity to really accelerate what impact this university will have, both in making sure that the AI is responsible and making sure that our students have the skills to amplify their experiences and their opportunities in the workforce. I think an issue in society at large is that the pace of change has been increasing over the decades. What's happened in AI is there has been this extraordinary burst in just the last year or two. And honestly, everybody has been caught a little bit flat-footed because none of us expected large language models to have the impact that they have. It caught e even experts in the field by surprise. The, the people who first deployed these large language models did not expect them to have the impact they did. One other relationship between data science and AI, by the way, is that uh, ethics was a significant component of our educational efforts in data science, and it will be, it will have to be in AI as well. So here's what's happening next. There are seven tables around the room. Uh, these folks and others will be at the tables. Uh, I'm going to have them come up and in 60 seconds apiece tell you what's going to happen at each of those tables. And then you'll have the opportunity to visit three of them in our final half hour. So what's going to happen is you pick the three that you want to spend time at. okay? And every 10 minutes I'm going to say switch and you go to the next one that you want to spend time at. All right? And um, you, uh, you know, you'll have some presentations, you'll have the opportunity for question and answers in uh, whatever depth you can fit in 10 minutes. We'll cut it down from the plan 15 because we started late and I know that you have other things to do today. So uh, let's begin with uh, Hannah, if you could come up to the podium and uh, talk about demystifying AI and large language models. And that will be at table one over here and Noah will join her. And Hannah Hajashurji is with the Allen School and also with the Allen Institute for AI. 